Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. Today is actually a very special day, at least for me. Today marks the 25th anniversary of the Sega Dreamcast in North America. Yes, it launched 25 years ago today on 9999. And that was obviously a really awesome marketing gimmick that they put out there. But um, I wanted to go over some of my memories about the Dreamcast, about how it was important to me and how it was special to me and what really the future holds for the Dreamcast. So let's go ahead and dive into that. Welcome back again. Uh, if you haven't been to my channel before, I appreciate you stopping by. I'm all about retro video games, whether it's console games, computer games. I'm also into physical media and movies and stuff like that i dabble a bit there but today we're going to be jumping into something that is very special to me the sega dreamcast and why not take today to commemorate a dreamcast system that has stayed around for a while and i've got one right here this is actually a it's in a little bit rough shape but i'm going to be refurbishing it and fixing it up and whatnot and yeah so i'm going to be taking care of it but this is the sega dreamcast system and if you weren't out, if you weren't alive for it when it was out uh, and supported, which it was only supported a very short amount of time, this system was very, very revolutionary to me specifically. It did a lot of things that were uh, new at the time, which I'll be following up with another video on about some firsts. But it was very special to me because I was a big Sega fan. I still am. And... I skipped over the Sega Saturn generation, so I didn't really get to experience that when it was new. At that time, I was into PC, and honestly, you know, we, our family didn't really see the value of getting into the Sega Saturn. We still had the, the Genesis and the 32X, and that was good enough. But when the Dreamcast came out, that was a much, much uh, bigger leap than I had anticipated, especially for a console. Uh, but yeah, it was my first system um, in that generation, and I remember Sonic Adventure blew me away. I'm a big Sonic fan, and I was a big Sonic fan there. Let me put this down. I was a big Sonic fan back then as well, and Sonic Adventure blew me away. I remember playing a demo of it. I think it may have been Toys R Us or something like that. And I mean, I had to, I had to have it day one. So we got it launch. Got a couple other games uh, at launch. I don't. I think it was like Soul Calibur, and um, trying to remember what else I got. Uh, yeah. Um, but anyways, so yeah, this one, you know, coming off of the Genesis Sonic, this was huge. The soundtrack was big, and the action was awesome. And yeah, of course, it was a little clunky. Of course, uh, the voice acting was was kind of kind of not great <laughs> at least for the uh north american release but this this game blew me away along with soul caliber and a ton of other games trick style that was the other one that i remember getting uh maybe ready to rumble boxing as well <laughs> but yeah that was such a great uh such a great time and you know i think we got it christmas that year so going into the into the new millennium and you know it really, uh, the Dreamcast for me really brought a lot of unique experiences. Um, you know, things like Seaman, where you got to, to talk in a microphone with a human-faced fish. It was all narrated by Leonard Nimoy. If you, haven't, if you haven't seen it, check it out. Maybe I'll do a video on it later. But awesome, unique experience. You also had a lot of great online experiences too so built into the system was actually a 56k modem uh right here and then of course you you could swap it out for a uh you know for a land port if you wanted to to if you if you end up getting high speed internet but 56k that was what i had at the time and that's what a lot of people had at the time so the games were actually really um they were compatible with 56k they were geared towards having a slower connection and it really started off with games like sonic adventure where there were some online capabilities where you could actually go in the game and go to the official sonic adventure website right through the sega dreamcast you dial in it have a website 
And what was really cool too is that there was actually timed DLC. So there was a Christmas DLC, there was I think Halloween, there was a launch DLC. There was different things that basically you would download onto your memory card, your VMU, and they were very small sizes. They had to be for 56k back then, but they were small enough where they were basically like there would be tree uh, Christmas trees littered around, banners, um, little things like that. So it wasn't like huge, huge content updates, but you know some games had some of that content that came out, and that was really neat. That was really interesting for the time. Some games would play online. You know, you had Sega Net, which was uh, their, uh, I believe that was their their network that you could uh, join. You could pay per month to join and be able to get access to play online. I think that was that was um, optional. So if you didn't have an internet service provider, you'd get uh, Sega Net and you can dial in and play the games online. But games like Alien Front Online with a microphone, you could speak to people while you're playing an arcade type game. Fantasy Star Online was something that was huge for me. I was not really into MMOs uh, at the time on PC, maybe you know one or two here or there. That, but um, Fantasy Star Online was really the one that was the breakthrough one for me, and it was really cool because there was a lot of preset different chat options that they touted as as kind of translated to multiple languages, and so that was really cool it, and again it worked really well on 56k connection which was huge at the time so it was very seamless worked really well and yeah so the experiences that you got to to play on the dreamcast were, were unlike anything i had ever played before and one thing that that the way that you played them was on the dreamcast controller and here's an example of that and again if you haven't seen one um it's definitely something that's unique this design is actually it didn't come out of a you know out of thin air it was actually based on the 3d controller design from the sega saturn so the 3d control pad that you use for nights into dreams um that was very similar the the, the, the uh, thumbstick was a bit bigger and more flat but this is kind of a blue controller version where the the it's funny because the the actual wired controller part comes out the bottom but there's a little little lip on the back here that you can you can you know snap the controller part into and and play it so this was very um i don't know i always love this controller people always you know uh say that it was it was bad design or whatever but i felt it was very good the d-pad is kind of meh but what's great is uh, in order to save your game most consoles you had the memory card slot on the console well in this one you could take your memory card and most consoles or uh, most instances it was the vmu or the visual memory unit or basically a little mini a little mini game game boy type thing right here that you could actually manage your saves you can connect two of them together the trade saves um there was also mini games on them but like chow garden on the the sonic adventure game but you basically plug it into the slot here and you slide it in you plug it in and now you've got a little display on your dreamcast controller so this would actually uh, depending on the game some of them would actually give you some some hints like uh, i believe if you're playing nfl 2k 2k1 you can uh, set your play on here so the people that are playing with you don't see what player you're going through but also you had a rumble pack as well yeah there was a bunch of other accessories you'd usually use the microphone and put it in the back here but the rumble pack would slide in uh, right here and snap right in and now you're all set and it's a really nice weight especially when it's fully loaded and it felt really well felt really good to play so this is the dreamcast controller and that's that's the one that we had to play with and honestly again i thought it was a great controller for the time it wasn't dual stick which ended up becoming the standard later on of course so some games like unreal tournament or quake 3 arena or just other games they you they had a very unique control scheme where you would kind of look with the, the thumbstick and you'd move with the d-pad but those games of course back then for, for me you know i was i was still fairly young and i was working on the weekend so i would definitely be saving my money to to play the games 
and buy the games. And I think, I think I was working weekends for like $5 an hour or something like that. <laughs> and what kept me motivated half the time was, you know, thinking about which Dreamcast games I wanted to buy. And I actually had a subscription or we, our family had a subscription to the official Dreamcast magazine. So I, I have a lot of the issues. I don't have all of them, but uh, this one, oh man, this and I had, I think, uh, Game Pro or Game Informer. Yeah, I think both uh, Game Pro and Game Informer. This would give me a heads up as to what games I'd want to look out for. It'd give you some news um, for what's coming up. Some of the cool industry uh, facets that, that the Dreamcast was actually going to be uh, breaking through. But with those and actually the system as well, you'd get demo discs. And the demo discs I played the heck out of. I played them so much, and depending on which games I really enjoyed, those are the ones I really wanted to to buy. You know, I wanted to, to invest my money in, and these were really cool. And and <laughs> I mean, this this is something that I still play. You know, every so often, I got a stack of uh, demo discs. But this was really instrumental in uh, me and a lot of other people figuring out what games they wanted to play. And actually, just sometimes you just play the demo disc for hours and hours and hours and that's what you got you didn't buy you didn't buy the games that were on you just play the demo discs but um so it was a unique time you know but you know the internet was very young and trying to, to download games uh was you know was was not very possible at the time so still very much a physical media based console that was online capable piracy was a thing but i have to say it from my experience, I know, because that's one of the big things that people really tout as the downfall of the Dreamcast was piracy, that uh, once they found, people found a loophole with uh, the mill CD format, uh, people were able to burn games easily. I mean, at the time when, when the Dreamcast was actually out and alive, I'll tell you right now, I didn't, I don't think I pirated any games um, I don't really know anybody that pirated it until after the, the, the life of the Dreamcast ended and it became a bit more readily available. Again, most people had 56K modems and, you know, didn't have access to high speed internet. And the, the ones that did that, you know, they were, they were probably pirating and stuff, but it was not as common, at least in my circles to pirate Dreamcast games until probably two or three years after the Dreamcast you know, was no longer mainstream, was no longer supported. So uh, that's that's something that I, I kind of always debated, uh, but, you know, about the downfall of the Dreamcast was piracy. So I'm going to say I didn't really see a whole lot of that back then, but I definitely did grow a bigger collection of um, games that were either uh, not released or they were released, um, you know, in, let's say... Uh, after after it was dead so like let's say half-life the the unreleased version of half-life came out um on the internet and was not formally released on the dreamcast but you know i downloaded a copy of that and was able to play and other things like that uh yu suzuki game works and propeller arena propeller arena famously canceled because of the 9 11 attacks and stuff like that so you know things like that i did download in in pirate and whatnot but uh that's that's something that i i've always i always kind of thought about and so one of the things that the dreamcast really was unique to me about was the aesthetic of it so you know the playstation the saturn every game console i feel like has its own its own feel you like you you see a screenshot of a game and a lot of times you can figure out what console it was on based on how it looked. You know, like Tomb Raider. Was there texture warping? Was there, you know, low polygon? It was either PlayStation or Saturn, depending on, you know, if, if you see some video. But the Dreamcast always had these bright, um, colorful, chunky graphics that were very sharp. You know, they're, they're very crisp and clear and lively, but uh, it's hard to describe. There was a lot of, you know, 2D uh, of artistry on some of these games as well, but, you know, especially coming after the PlayStation. But 
you know, it had its own aesthetic. I'm, I'm thinking games again, like Sonic Adventure. If you're thinking of that, like like Blue Stinger, um, uh, Marvel versus Capcom, obviously is is good for a uh, 2D game, very uh, bright and colorful. But um, on on the lines of the Capcom series, I'm thinking of like Power Stone, um, Skies of Arcadia. You know, you that aesthetic really um really came alive and really was unique at the time and that's that's what stuck with me as well throughout uh the 25 years it's it's been out <laughs> um but it really the dreamcast felt like it was at the time for me it was an introduction to a more connected gaming landscape with more possibilities you know you had the 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 turn of the century you had it you know the y2k uh, uh blowout everybody was excited for what the possibilities were in the dreamcast to me really embodied what future of entertainment future gaming could really be with the online connectivity with you know the vmu with a lot of the risks that sega took and and um third-party publishers took with the system i felt like it was a bright future for gaming because the dreamcast was was taking risks and and it, it burnt too brightly and and was uh ahead of its time in a lot of regards uh and and burnt out but i'll be going into some of my favorite games later on in other videos but let's talk a little bit about what the future holds for the dreamcast because in the 25 years since the dreamcast has not been in production there has been a lot of people like me that are fans of the Dreamcast and really wanted to continue seeing what the, that system could do and really continue to make experiences for that system. So in the 25 years since, there's been a lot more, especially I'd say the last decade or so, last 10 years, really big resurgence of indie games and online uh, releases like um, things like Intrepid Izzy, uh, in wave games studio you know there, there's a lot of a lot of titles like that i've already i've covered a couple of them on this channel as well and you know so the games like these that are that are polished there's some good ones out there as well that are kind of shorter and you know a little bit more sim simple but games that are more polished that's what's in the future as well more polished adventures some of them are online capable as well which is really great uh, driving strikers which is online as well and then you have games like classic cube which there's a it's like an open source version of minecraft there's a version of that for the dreamcast and that's also online so minecraft on the dreamcast that's <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> um there's also recently there's a new port of half-life in development for the dreamcast and i believe this is more based on the original gold source engine off the pc and not not that port that came out uh, that was officially developed for the dreamcast and canceled but this is more of a another port based on a gold source so uh, mod support lots of other uh, additions and engine tweaks maybe better performance because i know the famously the the release for half-life was it was fine, but there were some, some areas that were not very performant. You also have a lot of different hardware mods and alterations, like the VM2 uh, that, that was released. Basically a beefed up VMU, visual memory unit, a memory card that could do a lot of other functions. And there's another one on the horizon I saw that was, a, uh, was in the works as well, another VMU. Uh, for the Dreamcast, you know, because that's that's the one thing I didn't like about the VMUs was the space was kind of limited on these things. So if you wanted to play a lot of games, eventually you'd have to buy a bunch of them, or you'd have to buy the regular memory cards that were like uh, double or quadruple storage of these. Um, that's always that's always been a problem. Has been memory card storage space. So we're we're seeing solutions for that. And again, that's all based on the fan community. That's all based on small-time indie developers and passion projects of people that love the dreamcast um you also have some really cool things that uh i haven't i didn't really foresee but there are games that were originally on the dreamcast and arcades as well 
Uh, but originally on the Dreamcast, that are finally getting more wide support and more wide releases. So you have uh, Capcom is releasing a couple of collections. You've got Marvel vs. Capcom Fighting Collection Arcade Classics, which is going to have Marvel vs. Capcom 1 and 2 on it. And then you also have Capcom Fighting Collection 2, which will have Power Stone 1 and 2, which I think was only ever released on Dreamcast and PSP, PlayStation Portable. Uh, so it's been a long time since those games have seen the light of day officially other than arcade and that's really exciting that people are going to be able to play these games again and i've always been a fan of power stone and power stone 2 so that's been kind of the sega sega's answer to smash brothers in a way i guess not really um but that was kind of the most similar thing to smash brothers at that time and i've always been a big fan of it so glad to see that coming out but the future is actually in my opinion very bright for the dreamcast the dreamcast has always held a very very good legacy some people say it's overrated but in my opinion i feel like the vast majority of people who appreciate the dreamcast see that at the time games that came out on the dreamcast and other systems they were multi-platform generally played the best on dreamcast generally there's some exceptions but so the Dreamcast was important back then historically. There were a lot of really cool things that were were in development with the Dreamcast in mind. Uh, the significance between Microsoft and Sega working together, both on the Dreamcast and then you know being a big publisher on the original Xbox. That's been coming to light recently. But again, you know, as a, a Sega fan and as a Dreamcast fan. Reflecting on the past 25 years is really interesting to me because of where gaming has gone from there. And and really, th there are certain threads that started around that time, like DLC, or even just unpaid DLC, and now where, where we're at with that. And online gaming and where that's that's gone, and, you know, some, some ways it's similar, some ways it's uh, vastly different. And I feel like we're all living in a world that has been influenced by the, uh, lack of a better term, the majesty of the Dreamcast, the, the, the innovation of the Dreamcast and the games and the experiences that came out, but also were in development for it. And the world that Sega showed us with the Dreamcast was very bright, where gaming is the focus and having fun with your friends, either locally or online, is the main key. And I think that the dream still lives on, especially as we're seeing these newer games come out, as we're seeing these newer experiences come out, we're seeing the fan developers uh, continue to uh, bring you know games out to the Dreamcast. So I'm excited for what the future beholds for the Dreamcast. What do you think? Do you think there's a bright future for the Dreamcast ahead? Do you feel like the best years are behind us? Uh, do you feel like the Dreamcast was just overrated and was just a, a blip on the gaming radar and I'm putting too much emphasis on it? Let me know in the comments below. I really appreciate you stopping by and I'm going to be releasing probably a couple other videos around the Dreamcast more immediately, but I definitely plan to cover more content on the Dreamcast being a big fan of it in videos to come so again thank you for stopping by i hope you have a great day and game on